Good morning again, and thank you for joining our webinar. Today, we will discuss the types of physical barriers addressed in the updated ANSI B1119 standard. My name is Lisa Shaw, and I'll be your moderator. I work on the marketing team at SIC, and I'm excited to be hosting today's session. During this web webinar, the third of a four-part series, you will learn how you can reduce risk and discover the many nuisances associated with physical barriers. Just a little housekeeping before we get started, I wanna share that a recording of this webinar will be emailed to you following today's presentation. Also, feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar by typing your questions into the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll take some time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as time allows. Now, I wanna turn our time over to our presenter, Chris Serrano. Chris is a safety standards and competence manager at SIC. He is a certified functional safety expert and is a member of numerous ANSI committees and international working groups. Chris, I'll let you um, introduce yourself and you can take it away. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Chris Serrano. I'm a safety standards and competence manager for SIC. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I'm the, the, state, the resident standards geek here for SIC in the Americas. Um, and with that, we're gonna, I guess, just jump right into the topic. As Lisa mentioned, uh, we have a lot to cover. Um, physical barriers as a general concept for reducing risk in the workplace seems pretty simple, um, but there is a lot of nuance that goes with it, and that's what we wanna identify here today. Uh, so first thing we start with is identifying functions of physical barriers. When I say physical barriers, I mean something a little bit larger than just the guard. Uh, so really, or the way that we try to break it down in this presentation, at least, is there's three main categories that fall under that general headline of physical barriers. First, we have guards, the traditional thing that keeps Pearson away from the hazard. We then have shields as a, another subpart of a barrier. And then lastly, awareness barriers. And so these are kind of the three buckets that we're gonna investigate a little bit further here today. So, First, let's start with the definitions. Is any, any good standard is gonna define the words they use as they're intended within that document. And there's definitions on the screen. I'm not gonna read them to you, but they're there for reference. Really what I wanna focus on are the examples. A guard is something that, that prevents exposure to the hazard. And if I put that in layman's terms, what that really means is it, it keeps people out. There's an area, there's probably one or more hazards in there, and the guard keeps the people away from the hazard. Converse to that, we have a shield. A shield is a barrier that keeps the hazard in. So again, layman's terms, it keeps the hazard in. It could be one or more hazard. In this example uh, of the lathe, we're not looking at the hazard of the rotating tooling or the rotating workplace. What we're concerned with, the hazard we're concerned with, are the chips and coolants and swarf that could be ejected and coming out towards the operator. And then the last type of physical barrier that we're, we will investigate today are awareness barriers. So an awareness barrier is something that simply provides a warning, usually with physical contact. Um, so it doesn't actually prevent anything, it just gives an extra level of notification, of warning that there's a hazard if you cross this boundary. So if we look at these three categories, these three types of physical barriers, um, the first two, the guards and the shields, actually meet the definition of a barrier as used in the standard, which is an object that provides a physical boundary to a hazard. An awareness barrier, on the other hand, is a, a barrier that warns an individual of an impending or approaching hazard, but doesn't actually stop them from accessing the area. It's simply warning. So if we look at the larger hierarchy of controls as it's broken down in this new standard, uh, step one is inherently safe by design measures, and none of these are considered inherently safe. Uh, when we get to step two of risk reduction, that includes guards, control functions, and devices. And here, guards and shields meet that requirement of a physical boundary that prevents access to a hazard. And then the last step, administrative controls, uh, where there's more reliance on human behavior, human action, is where the awareness barrier falls in because it's simply a warning. 
it provides the warning, but individuals in the workplace need to be trained how to properly act and, and behave when those warnings are, are made present to them. So when we look at the purpose, the intent of the physical barriers, we have to keep in mind what we're talking about here today. We're talking about safety of people in the workplace. And so a lot of that discussion revolves around My mouse froze. Revolves around <laughs> the idea of risk assessment. I do apologize, but my computer just completely froze. Lisa, I'd uh, welcome any input you might have. Uh, sure, it looks like it just turned to the PowerPoint next. Just shut. Yeah, I know my PowerPoint just uh, completely locked up and froze, so I apologize here as I try to get it rebooted and jump back into where we were. That's right. Best laid plans. There we go. And here we were. So awesome. hopefully we're back up and running. You mm -hmm. can all see this. Okay, so as I was saying, sorry about that, is that when we talk about safety in the workplace, everything is predicated on the idea of a risk assessment. Uh, so we need to understand the risk. And then once we've determined that there's risk that's not acceptable, we have to do something about it by applying risk reduction measures. And in this context, a risk reduction measure is some action or some means used to eliminate hazards or reduce the risk. Um, so some things flat out make the risk go away and other times we simply reduce either the severity or the probability of exposure between the person and the hazard. So in that context then a guard is a barrier that provides protection from a hazard and again it's intended to minimize possibility, sorry, of unintentionally reaching the hazard. So the risk assessment is the thing that we use to determine the technical feasibility and the, and the practicability of the requirements that apply to the different types of physical barriers we're going to review. And we have to consider the intended purpose and things we have to consider include whether or not we're trying to all out prevent or simply reduce access to the hazard zone. Part of that addresses that whether it's intentional access we're trying to address or simply inadvertent contact with the hazard and other types of modalities of exposures. So essentially what we're saying is that different guards, different types of physical barriers are going to carry different weight in the overall approach to the risk reduction. So when we go back to our buckets, our, th our three main types of physical barriers, some of them are in step two of risk reduction, uh, one of them's in step three, and there's a delineation made there. And that delineation should correlate to the risk assessment. So when we do risk assessment, we look at the uh, inherent risk associated with the machine, assuming no protective measures are in place, and determine how best to reduce those. So essentially, somewhere um, within your organization, within your team doing your risk assessment, you're going to draw a line and say anything above a certain risk level needs something that's a bit more reliable, that's not as dependent on human behavior. And my preference is what we see on the screen here, usually medium to high risks. Um, we're going to use step two measures first, might be in combination with other elements, uh, whereas if the inherent risk is relatively low, it could be that awareness means are sufficient by themselves or again in combination with other elements. What this tells us is in order to hit our mark to, to actually achieve the amount of risk reduction we're looking for, we have to understand the application. So if the hazard that we're trying to protect against are big, scary, carnivorous animals, we typically are going to use guards, something that physically keeps the person out, might also act as a shield because it's keeping the hazard in, and that can be much more reliable than a simple awareness barrier that says, be careful if you cross the line. So it's all predicated on the risk. So now we're going to jump into the different 
types of features associated with physical barriers. There's a lot of different categories, there's different features that distinguish them, and that we'll just take a quick look at all of them here. So the first one we're gonna start with, the, the more obvious of them all, is the fixed guard. So as I stated before, risk assessment really is the key that's gonna help us identify what measure is the most applicable for any given application. So risk assessment starts with evaluating the application. Here we have an example, there's conveyors feeding packages, the robot picks up the packages, puts them on the shelf, and a person comes by and removes those packages and, and carries them away. So just a typical packaging application, if you will. And if we do our evaluation of this application, we can actually divide this into different zones, areas on the machine. First thing we do is we look at the, we have to identify the hazards. And this is just a really basic approach, but in one zone of the machine, we have in-running NIPs associated with the conveyors. In another zone, we have moving hazards associated with the industrial robot. And in another example, another zone, we have um, possible crushing of the hand uh, where the person interacts if a package were to be set down. From there, if we follow the risk assessment process, we identify the affected people. Well, inside the machine where the conveyors are, maybe it's only maintenance people that go in there. Maybe it's only someone doing observation or programming that goes in near the robot, whereas the operator's main focus of interaction is with the packages at the outside edge of the, of the application. Once we know the people that are affected, we identify the tasks that they're doing. The maintenance person is doing maintenance, preventative maintenance, ongoing um, tasks just to make, keep the machine running. Uh, maybe at the robot, there's observation, there's touch-up of the program, and then the operator's doing, again, basic operating tasks of removing packages. And then we want to look at the frequency. How often do these tasks occur? Maintenance probably doesn't occur nearly as often as uh, maintenance or teaching on the robot, which isn't as often as the operator interfacing with the machine or the system. Based on this, we can combine the hazard and the task where they overlap and determine what's the level of risk at the function of the severity of the hazard as well as the probability of a person encountering that hazard. So we may have different levels of risk throughout different parts of the machine. And then when we determine that that risk is not acceptable, not tolerable, that's when we say we have to do something about it and we apply risk reduction measures. And so this is where we get into selecting the practicability of the measure based on the task and the hazard that's being addressed. So here, where um, to select the appropriate risk reduction measure, where frequency is really low, six guard is probably sufficient. Where, um, where frequency is a bit more um, frequent, we might use perimeter guards in most applications and then where access points are necessary, we have movable guards that are interlocked, which we call an interlocked guard. And in some applications where the frequency is so high, we might decide that, that some type of physical boundary just isn't practical, and we need some other type of risk reduction measure like a presence sensing device. So this is just a really basic overview of the risk assessment process and how the different factors identified through it help in the selection of risk reduction measures that are appropriate for the application. Another thing we have to consider, uh, which is applicable to all guards, all risk reduction measures, is that they have to be evaluated to make sure that they prevent unauthorized changes. And every, every workplace, changes are inevitable and they need to be done, but they should only be performed by people who are authorized. It means that they're trained and they're given permission to do a certain task. And part of this includes preventing reasonably foreseeable misuse. So we have to address these things in our risk reduction measures. When we look at preventing unauthorized changes to a guard, often we think about using hardware that requires a tool that's not readily available. So it shouldn't be using um, a number of fasteners. If there's different fastening types that, that are readily available to operators in the workplace or even visitors, and those are the things we want to avoid. And so, what we do want is to secure our risk reduction measures in a way that only authorized people have access to them. A common example is using tamper-resistant fasteners. That's not impossible, but at least reduces the likelihood that everyone has access to it. 
And within the new standard, it goes on and gives a bunch of examples of types of things that do not provide the level of tamper resistance necessary for a risk reduction measure. So these are all things that you see these in the workplace uh, and they're applied to a risk reduction measure. You should probably reconsider how it's secured and fastened to the application. Then we move on to movable guards, as the name applies. There's a portion of the physical um, mechanical structure that's movable, that can move. Uh, basic instruction is that they should not open towards the hazard or the hazard zone. We want to make sure that there's clear space, that it slows down person's momentum as they reach the hazard, and if they're inside the hazard zone, it, it gives them clearance to get out. So typically what this means is that the guard should either open laterally or it should open vertically or it should move away from the hazard or the hazard zone. When we talk about it as a risk reduction measure, then we also have to consider that the movable section, if it allows access to a hazard, has to either be interlocked with a device, which makes that movable guard plus an interlock now an interlocked guard, which we'll talk about here in a moment, or it has to be securely fastened, which in essence makes it a fixed guard. Sometimes we hinge portions of a guard simply so that when the infrequent tasks can occur, uh, the guard stays in place, maybe the guard's large and heavy, um, but we want to have access to it under known conditions like lockout, tagout, um, but during normal operation, it doesn't need to be open. It, the frequency of it being opened is low, and so we can use fasteners to secure it. So as we're talking about securely fastened, like we just mentioned, it could be, for example, using tamper-resistant fasteners to keep it shut. It could include other things like a lock and a hasp. You lock it shut and the key here is the key itself. Make sure that it's uniquely keyed and that only authorized people have access to the key. Now, if we cannot do either of these, we can't interlock it or we can't securely fasten it, then it starts to slip in our overall hierarchy of controls and what it offers in terms of risk reduction and may if it's movable but not interlocked or secured, might become an awareness barrier or a shield, which are different types of physical barriers that we'll talk about here later on. So continuing on, uh, we then have partial guards. This is one of the new elements addressed in the standard. Um, partial guard, as it suggests, is going to limit access but not necessarily eliminate it. So it provides some level of protection against inadvertent access to a hazard, but if somebody's really trying, they can still get into the hazard. So again, it's based, based and predicated on the risk assessment. So it's gonna prevent accidental or inadvertent access. It could enclose the hazard, but usually not. It's gonna enclose as much of it as what is possible. And because of that, it's probably not gonna prevent people from accessing the hazard by reaching around, under, through, or over the guard. So there's all kinds of examples of partial guards in the workplace. Uh, the one I'll focus on down here in the bottom right corner, which we saw earlier, we use this as an example of a shield for the chips coming out. This is also used as a partial guard if we look at different hazard. If the hazard is the rotating workpiece, this is a partial guard that prevents me from falling into it accidentally, but doesn't prevent me from reaching around into it intentionally. So it acts as a shield to keep the chips in, it acts as a partial guard to keep me from accidentally accessing the hazard of the rotating tooling. From there, we then go on to NIP guards, which is another new element in the standard, uh, used often in web-based applications, uh, pulp and paper printing, other examples like that. Um, and the idea here is it's used at in-running NIP points. And uh, both B1119 and B110 as an A-type standard address and define different types of in-running NIP points. It's not an all-inclusive list, but it's the very common examples of in-running NIPs, either two rotating elements within proximity to each other or a rotating element close to a fixed element or even a single rotating element with material uh, wrapping over or around it. These are all examples of in-running NIPs. So to guard those with a NIP guard, what we need to do is design elements that prevent unintended contact with an individual. So again, it's not gonna prevent intentional access to hazards, there's other hazards there, but it's gonna reduce the likelihood of severe injury. 
what we have to consider not only is in the forward motion, the in-running nips at the in-running side, but also uh, if the machine can go in reverse, has a reversing capability, there could also be in-running nips on the opposite side of those rolls during certain portions of the machine cycle. And another thing that's often overlooked is what exactly is defined as the hazard. People often think it's where the two rolls touch but we've seen many applications where the rolls never actually come in direct contact with each other. Um, so that really isn't, isn't the issue. That's not where the hazard is. What we define as the hazard across many standards is where the surface of those rolls come within 10 millimeters of each other. That's essentially the, uh, at where the, the finger or part of the finger can begin to, to either get trapped or engage with the friction of the roll and pulled into the hazard and, and, and injury can occur. So when we design guards, we have to prevent what are known as wedge pockets. And so the recommendation as much as possible is that a guard be mounted so that it's at least 90 degrees to the surface of the, of the, of the cylinder. We also acknowledge that in some cases that's not possible. And so the absolute minimum is a 60 degree angle to the surface, but 90 degrees or more is what's recommended. The reason for that is so that if somebody's hand or finger does get caught on the roll and start with the friction starts to get pulled into that hazard point, you don't want them to get jammed in and pulled into an area where they're wedged into uh, or against the guard itself. And then in addition to that, Typically, we want the guards to be no more than a quarter inch away from the surface of the roll, accounting for material and everything that still has to go in there. But if it's more than a quarter inch, fingertip or more of the body part could possibly get pulled into the hazard zone. Within the new standard, there's a new annex that addresses nip guards, gives more guidance. Um, that's where all the examples of the in-running nips are provided. And it includes examples of in-running uh, of NIP guards, different ways to guard in-running NIP points. Uh, it gives examples for using partial guards or side shields in combination with NIP guards, and actually provides a really good example of how to determine the appropriate distance of the guard from the hazard, again, where the hazard's within 10 millimeters of each other, um, and how to properly locate and distance the guards from that hazard point. So there's a lot of good information now in the standard that wasn't there previously. As we continue on, uh, we then address interlocked guards. Earlier we discussed movable guards, and when we put an interlock on a movable guard, that becomes an interlock guard. It's pretty simple. And the requirements that go along with that uh, is that when the guard opens, it has to initiate immediate stop. And we can't start the hazard until the guard's closed again. What this means is we either have to prevent the guard from opening until the hazard stops. So if I have a machine with a long rundown time, I might need to lock the door shut until a safe condition exists. That's a, an interlock device with guard locking That's the feature. Or if it stops quickly, we simply need to make sure that the guard is located at a distance so that the machine comes to a stop before a person can reach in and touch parts before they achieve a safe condition. And in addition, the devices that we use to interface the guard to the safety related part of the control system, often it's one interlock device. Sometimes there's more than one. At a minimum, at least one of them um, has to have a positive mode of operation. So when we talk about electromechanical devices, the one on the left down here, what we see is when the door opens, so when it swings out, there's a cam that rotates and physically forces the plunger into the switch, which mechanically forces contacts open. This is what we talk about as positive mode of operation. If there's a spring failure, the contacts will still open when the doors open. If the contacts are welded shut for some reason, um, they, will be, they will open. They might break and it won't close again, but it'll force it to a safe condition. Alternatively, what we see in the other example is when the door opens, we're relying on a spring to open contacts. If the spring's broken, if the contacts are welded, we have a failure mode, a common cause failure that should be accounted for. In addition, in this example, 
it's not very difficult for someone to easily tamper with or bypass this device with just a piece of tape or a piece of wire over the actuator. So these are the types of things we want to avoid when interlocking movable guards. Um, we said that the hazard couldn't begin until the guard is closed, but we also have to be aware that with an interlock guard, closing the guard in and of itself isn't the thing that initiates the hazardous motion, the hazardous condition. There has to be a separate deliberate action to restart the equipment. Um, so what this means is if we have applications with a small guard where your whole body cannot get into the area, maybe you're just reaching into a box or loading parts into something. Um, in this example, uh, we have a hazard, it's stopped with the guard open. When we close the guard, again, closing the guard doesn't initiate the hazard. We need a separate deliberate action, in this case, reinitiation of the start command to, to reinitiate the hazard. As we addressed in our last webinar, uh, which is available on demand on our, on our library, we talked about this concept of whole body access. With whole body access, now there's a possibility that somebody could be in the hazard zone with the hazard. So here, again, closing the guard in and of itself doesn't begin a hazardous condition, uh, but here we need to take steps to ensure other people are not inside the hazard zone before the hazard's initiated. One common way to do that is with a reset, which simply arms the safety system, and then a separate deliberate action which initiates the hazardous motion. So in both cases, at least one deliberate action was necessary. In some cases, it could be more. From there, then we move on to movable barrier devices. So this one's a bit unique. There's a bit of a nuance. Uh, it's hard to tell in this image, but here this big yellow element with the black uh, bumper at the bottom is a door that automatically goes up and down uh, to contain the hazard zone. So that uh, we have to look at the nuance, the differences between a simple movable guard and movable guard with an interlock and a movable barrier devices. They, the names kind of sound the same, but they're defined differently and they have very distinct features. All of them can be easily opened without a special tool. They're designed to be operated frequently. However, putting an interlock on it, now it's no longer a movable guard. It's either an interlock guard or a movable barrier device. What's unique between those two is that a movable barrier device when it's closed is going to initiate a hazardous machine function. We just talked about an interlock guard. Closing the interlock guard cannot initiate the hazard. With a movable barrier device, when it closes, it can initiate the hazardous machine function. So this here really is the nuance between the two. Movable, bar movable barrier device is very different from an interlocked guard. And because it can initiate hazardous motion automatically, it absolutely, under no circumstances, can be used in applications where whole body access is possible. So what we think about here is that uh, with a movable barrier device, it's going to open. You're going to load parts, unload parts, do what you're going to do, and as soon as it closes, it, it initiates the hazardous function. That's going to continue on and over and over. It might open automatically. It might open based on a manual command. Um, these are all just a common example of movable barrier devices. What's unique is because it can close automatically is we need to make sure that if there's an obstruction, especially if that obstruction is part of a person, that not only does it detect that hazard, but it needs to, it has to address that hazardous condition, often by forcing it to return open. That's typically done with an additional presence uh, sensing device or risk reduction measure like a, a pressure sensitive edge or bumper so that when it, and when it detects the obstruction, it automatically reverses and opens so that the obstruction can be removed. We also have to consider that the movable barrier device itself may create new hazards which have to be addressed. So we just talked about the hazard in the down motion. What if in the up motion, especially if there's a frame around the guard, we have to consider that could, there could possibly be crushing hazards there as well, and they have to be addressed through the risk assessment. Now, a nuance here that doesn't exist internationally is that we, we describe in North America two 
subtypes, the type A and type B movable barrier device. The names of themselves don't give a whole lot of clarity. So we're just gonna do a quick history lesson here and explain how these types came to be. And they, it originated in the press industry. So for those of you familiar with presses or not familiar with presses, a uh, long time ago, full revolution press was very common. They're not as common now, um, thankfully, but with a full revolution press, once the cycle was initiated or tripped, the complete cycle is gonna, has to conclude before it's going to stop again. Conversely, there are part revolution presses in the mechanical press world, uh, uses a clutch and brake so that it engages, disengages, and can stop anywhere throughout the cycle. Uh, so it gives us a, a higher level of reliability and gives us more capability of types of risk reduction measures we can use with that type of machine. But in both cases, if we determine that we want a movable barrier device, whether it's to keep parts from flying out or if it's uh, just to increase cycle times, they mechanically look exactly the same. The difference is in the control logic for a full revolution press that can only stop once in its cycle and sometimes, unfortunately, misses that stop point and could, let's call it a phantom cycle, could cycle a second time. We need to make sure that the hazard is stopped before we allow access to the hazard zone. So what this means is the guard closes, initiates the cycle. Once the hazard is achieved, then the door opens. With a type B movable barrier device, when it's used on machines that can stop anywhere in their cycle reliably, we close it to initiate the cycle. And as long as there's no hazard on the upstroke, we can open the barrier on the non-hazardous portion of the machine cycle. So if I initiate both of these simultaneously here in a second, you'll see that there's a higher level of productivity over time with the type B device. It allows operators to unload and load parts a half second faster. And over the course of a shift, you start to see real gains in productivity. But we have to keep in mind if it's a full revolution type of machine, whether it's a press or anything else, the type A movable barrier device has to be used to ensure that the hazard has stopped before access is granted to the hazard zone. So then we work our way through additional functions of physical barriers. Uh, here I group together both adjustable guards and self-adjusting guards. Um, they're very similar. One is adjusted manually by hand. The other is adjusted automatically, typically by the workpiece. Uh, they have a number of similarities. Both of them have to remain in adjustment throughout the operation. They both have to be installed and adjusted by qualified people before operation of the machine. And operators and maintenance personnel have to be trained on the purpose and the proper adjustment of the, of the guard. The only difference really between the two is that an adjustable guard to be adjustable has to be readily adjustable. So in the example up here in the top left corner, we see this red knob here is what allows the operator to easily adjust the stroke length in this example of a guard that's on a drill press. Whereas with a self-adjusting guard, we want it to always be functional. There should be no adjustment. The adjustment should be inherent to the design of the guard. So really the only difference is whether the adjustment is occurring manually or automatically through the engagement with the workpiece. So perimeter guards, another exciting element of physical barriers. Um, before we can talk about the perimeter guard, we have to understand the concept of the perimeter. A perimeter is a boundary around an area created with risk reduction measures. So in this example, this red line is a defined boundary around an area. And within the context of the standard, that perimeter can be established either with engineering controls, guards and devices on step two of the hierarchy, or with awareness barriers from step three of the hierarchy. And how we select those, again, is based on a risk assessment. So in this example, we have guards, we have devices, we have interlocks. We've defined this perimeter in this example with engineering controls, step two. A perimeter guard, now, different than the perimeter, the perimeter guard is the mechanical element that prevents access to one or more hazards. So mechanical means we're ignoring the present sensing devices, 
We're ignoring the interlock device. We're looking at only the mechanical solution. And in this example, clearly, there's one or more hazards that it's um, preventing access to and acknowledges that it could be a combination, it could be a combination of fixed guards, all the areas where we don't need frequent access, and could be a combination of movable guards, the access point where we need to get in in a more frequent um, cadence, and those movable guards either are either interlocked or secured, as we discussed before. It's important to point out that a perimeter guard is very different than an awareness barrier. Both of them can be used to define a perimeter in the general sense, but a perimeter guard prevents access. An awareness barrier simply gives you warning that there's a hazard, but doesn't prevent somebody from climbing over or through the railings. And these perimeter guards, also known as fixed distance guards um, in other standards and other circles. Minimum requirements that are now established in B1119, which is a type B standard, meaning it applies to many types of machines, is that the minimum height of the guard has to be at least 55 inches from the work, working surface, and the gap below the guard can be no greater than seven inches. These are now established, um, pulled from um, scientific research and other standards uh, used internationally. Now, these are minimum maximum openings and heights. What it says is that if there's a risk assessment is done, you might need other heights. So based on the arc of the arm, how far I can reach, if I can reach over the hazard and there's uh, reach over the guard to a hazard zone or some other element I don't want a person to touch, I might need guards that are higher. And same thing, if a person can lay down and reach their arm in and reach something they shouldn't, then the guards might need to be lower at the bottom. We, so what standard now does is it establishes minimum dimensions and gives guidance on how to increase those dimensions accordingly. Then we get into awareness barriers, which are the, the final element of the different functions of physical barriers. As we discussed before, these are type three, or step three in risk reduction, um, because what it does is it, it is installed so that it doesn't prevent a person from reaching the hazard. Um, they can still get to it, but it's gonna take some conscious, eff conscious effort or some level of contact with the barrier. Um, so if we look at all the requirements that go into a guard and what separate a guard from an awareness barrier and look at examples, here we have uh, the chain and post, we have stanchions with retractable uh, elements, we have expanding um, physical barriers. In most cases, these are not securely fastened or interlocked. You can clearly reach over, through, around, and under, um, all of which are requirements to be a guard. Since it doesn't meet any of those requirements, it's clearly not a guard. It's an awareness barrier. What about railing? Well, railing, they are fastened, sometimes interlocked, but it's very easy to climb over, through it, or under it. Because of that, it does not meet all the requirements for a guard, so these two are awareness barriers. Now, what about something like this? It looks like a, a, a movable guard. It, can, it feels like a movable guard. It might be securely fastened or interlocked, but if it doesn't meet the, the appropriate height requirements so that I can't reach towards the hazard, then as you can assume, since it doesn't meet all of those requirements, this is not an awareness, uh, not a guard. It is an awareness barrier. For it to truly be a guard, you have to prevent all the reaching functions and it has to be securely fastened or interlocked. Now what some people will want to do is say, well, can I, I have an idea, can I address all these reach factors simply by putting a sign on it and say, don't reach the hazard. Here's your warning, physical contact, here's your warning with a written warning, is that sufficient? And in most cases, again, based on the risk assessment, but in most cases, it may not be enough. Um, it clearly does not cover the gaps to make these first three examples a guard. It's still an awareness barrier. It just happens to have an awareness sign with it. And so all that tells us is that it's still only applicable for lower risk applications. We then look at shields. 
which are the things that keep hazards in, as we discussed. Um, in these examples here, it could be ejected parts from the tooling, it could be ejected parts from the workpiece, um, but they're typically used to prevent inadvertent contact by individuals and are gonna be used for different types of hazards that could be expelled from the work zone, from the, the, the workpiece, from the point of operation. There's all types of different hazards that could be expelled and because of that, there's different types of shields that could be appropriate. Some shields might work on more than one type of hazard. Um, if we're talking usually like a polycarbonate uh, type of guard, whether it's small or large, it can help with chips and fumes and fluids. If we're talking about noise, we often see um, either um, baffling that either absorbs the noise or redirects it up and away from the operators for uh, hazards that could be expelled physically. We sometimes see um, ballistic grade paneling that's used to contain those hazards and radiation, a uh, common one being lasers or weld flash. Uh, we have certain types of shields that are appropriate for the type of radiation that is present in the workplace. So there's another annex in the standard that I do wanna talk about briefly um, it was in the previous edition that people didn't really know was there, so I think it's important to talk about. There's an entire annex that talks about performance considerations when using shields as a risk reduction measure. And one of the things, of the many that it talks about, is deterioration for its overall effectiveness and what could impact that. Uh, it could be size, shape, exposure to coolants or swarf. The one I really wanna focus on here just briefly is age. And there's an example aging curve in the document that says the day you install your transparent vision panel, it's 100% impact resistance. It's meeting its initial specification. But after only three years, due to age alone, it's reduced to 50% of its impact resistance. After three more years, it drops to a quarter of that. And after 10 years, we're at only 10% of its impact resistance. So if we think about the concept of functional safety and the idea of 20 year mission time, this tells us that in only half that time, this guard has, has lost its impact resistance drastically, which indicates probably need to, needs to be inspected on some periodic level. And thankfully there's a new uh, technical report being developed on that called ANSI B11.TR8, which should be out shortly, hopefully within the next uh, six to 12 months to give guidance on that. But essentially, we have to consider that over time, either the workpiece clamp or the tooling could possibly become loose. And if that transparent vision panel, if that shield has deteriorated its impact resistance drastically enough, that ejected part or component may not be able to be contained after a certain amount of time. And if we're relying on that to reduce risk to people, we have to ensure its effectiveness throughout the life cycle of the machine. So now we've addressed all the different types of physical barrier features. And in reality, what we have to understand is that they're probably gonna be combined together. Based on any application, there's probably more than one hazard source or hazard consequence and different types of barriers might be necessary to get to this concept of acceptable risk that's addressed in B11-0. So if we look at some common examples, so down the left are all the different um, functions of physical barriers that we discussed. Here's a robotic welding application. We look at the yellow mesh with, uh, with the uh, red paneling in it. We see that it functions as different elements. It's a fixed guard, it's a perimeter guard, and it's a shield. Here, uh, what I'm focusing on in this image is simply in the foreground, this element with the black bar at the bottom, and in the back, it's the same thing closed, the, the orange panel with the windows, the movable barrier device. Um, it initiates the hazardous function, it acts as a perimeter, and it acts as a shield. In a CNC machine, uh, the, just the point of operation guards, they're movable, they're interlocked, they act as shields. In the printing industry, uh, we see here, it looks like it's stainless steel. We see a couple of elements in here guarding the in-running nip points. And again, it functions a couple of different ways. So there's multiple uses for an individual mechanical element. Here in a lathe, it, it functions partly as a partial guard, 
because it prevents contact, inadvertent contact to the rotating hazard. It also acts as a shield from the hazard of the ejected parts. So what we see is that in reality, you're gonna probably check more than one box for the functions that a mechanical structure could fulfill, and therefore we have to be aware of all the requirements that apply to them. So briefly now we're gonna jump into safety distance as we come to the, towards the end of this presentation, uh, but distance of the guard from the hazard is another important factor which is often overlooked. In a general sense, there's guidance for ensuring you can't reach over, a over the guard to the hazard, you can't reach through or around the guard to the hazard, and you can't reach under the guard to the hazard. So from the last version, the previous version of B1119, the 2010 edition, we've simplified reaching over, we've completely updated the reaching through and around, and what's brand new is reaching under. So we'll talk about each of these here real briefly, but before we do that, we have to understand just basic anthropomorphic measurements. For a present sensing device, the arm reach is 850 millimeters. So how far you can reach over the beam of a light curtain, for instance, without activating it is 850 millimeters. For a physical structure like a guard, that measurement is slightly larger. It's 900 millimeters. And the reason is you can lean on the top edge of a guard whereas you cannot lean on a beam of a present sensing device. So we have to start just with the, the simple mechanics of the application. What this means is that for present sensing devices, the reaching distances, reaching over and reaching under, we use that 850 millimeter arm sweep, which is roughly 33, 34 inches. For physical structure, the safety distance is predicated on that longer reach because we can lean, we can press against a physical structure and get a little bit more out. We get closer to 36 inches of reach that has to be accounted for. So with that then, we start, first start talking about reaching over guards. Make sure you can't reach over the guard to the hazard. Uh, in the previous edition of B1119, there were two tables provided which came from the international market. There was a table for high risk and a table for low risk. That was the old way of thinking. And what's happened now is that we've realized that if there's a hazard and somebody can access it, it shouldn't matter if they get hurt really bad infrequently or if they get hurt a little bit frequently. Injury is an injury is an injury and we wanna prevent it. So in the new standard, there is no more table that's low risk. We use the conservative and proven data for what used to be called the high risk table. Now it's just the reach over table. Uh, it was, it was um, embellished a bit with some English measurements, but it's the same table as before. And what we're saying is that it's simplified because you don't have to decide now where's the threshold of using one or the other. I just use the table. Uh, next we talk about either reaching through the guard to the hazard or reaching around a guard to a hazard. They're essentially the same concept. And previously there was guidance based on a study from 25 that was published 25 years ago that gave guidance on distances for slotted openings and distances for square openings but no no guidance for openings that were round in shape what's happened now is an alignment with international studies and international standards where there's now slotted square and round openings and as you can see is an overlay these are uh, relative scale to each other uh, that the differences are drastic, but it's based on and proven by international studies based on different uh, genders and ethnicities of the adult workforce. So in this case, it's been completely updated from what it used to be. And then the last one, reaching under a guard. We've always said you shouldn't do it, but there's never been guidance for a dimension to say whether someone could or couldn't reach that hazard. So we've already established that for perimeter guards, there's a limitation for the maximum opening at the bottom of 180 millimeters. Uh, and we know that if someone were to reach into the hazard zone, the hazard needs to be far enough away from the guard to prevent it. So first thing we look at is if the, that opening is less than 120 millimeters. And if we use the guidance from reaching through, which uh, goes up to 120 millimeter opening, which is essentially the breadth of the shoulder 
and we think under a guard is typically a slotted shape opening, we can use the table for a slotted opening to determine how far away a guard should be from a hazard. Now, if I can get more than my shoulder, so the opening is more than 120, but still within the maximum threshold of 180, we still need more guidance. And essentially, if we look at the reach over table, which has been in use for many, many years, that looks at the arm sweep in a direction against a physical obstruction and how far you can reach. We can take that same guidance and look at that same arm with the same arc just in the opposite direction against a physical obstruction. And what happened was a creation of a table, which gives you, based on the height of the hazard and the opening of the guard, how far away the, they should be from each other. So for small openings, we have guidance based on existing data. For larger openings, we have guidance that also is based on existing data that was out there. And so this is new. So when we have to balance all these reaching distance considerations, we have to make sure you can't reach over, you can't reach through, you can't reach under the protective structure. So that means is you do your evaluation for whichever is applicable to the application and make sure that your total distance of the guard from the hazard is the largest of those three measurements. So in summary, um, this standard, as it addresses types of physical barriers directly, has specific clauses with specific requirements in the standard. There are general requirements that also apply to them, either always or sometimes. There's informative annexes that apply. Um, we talked about intended purpose, whether they will prevent access or reduce access, and then the three main buckets of guards, shields, and awareness barriers. This table is in the white paper that this presentation is based on, uh, which I'll direct you to here in a moment. What I do want to point out real quick is that what we see is in the new 2019 edition of the standard, there's five new barrier functions that are discussed that had not been previously. And in addition, some of the other requirements on this table only apply when there's an interlock involved. Uh, so for instance, an interlocked guard obviously has an interlock, so there's requirements for devices and there's some safety distance and reach considerations that apply. The same applies in other places where interlocks could be used. So just a, a brief overview of all the guidance of when to select which parts and which parts of the standard might apply based on your application. Uh, as a summary of the reaching factors, uh, this is what we had in 2010. In 2010, we addressed reaching over with low and high risk. We addressed reaching through of the finger and hand with slotted and square openings and nothing else. In 2019, in this new edition that was just published in January, the low risk table went away and the high risk table was maintained and, and augmented with English measurements. For reaching through, there's now guidance to define unique shapes. It helps you define whether it should be treated as a slotted square or round opening. And then the measurements for slotted openings have been modified, square openings have been modified, and new measurements available for round openings. All of this has been updated, and it's based on a table. There's also guidance that we didn't address here today about openings where you can reach your arm, but there's some obstruction that limits um, rotation to certain joints of the arm. There's guidance about whole body access and how to prevent it with physical structures. And then an element that uh, was slightly overlooked uh, from previous editions of the standard was this idea of indirect approach, where there's an opening you can reach through and maybe bend your hand or your fingers and reach and ac uh, or access a hazard and how to make sure the distance is appropriate. And then the reaching under, which we just addressed for small openings or larger openings, is all brand new. What this does is it brings us into much greater alignment with guidance used in the international market. Uh, the equivalent standard for distances of guards is ISO 13857. The U.S. standard is now completely aligned in these elements highlighted here. And there are a few additional elements are going to be proposed for further alignment in the future. So with that, um, I know there's, you might be asking for more information. Um, we've posted a number of elements on our blog, uh, which you can always find information there. And there's also an entire series of, uh, an entire series of white papers uh, specifically to the new ANSI B11 standard. 
Uh, this presentation today is based on part four of that series. The part five was just recently published and the final uh, edition will probably come out sometime in August. And then in addition, we also have webinars, just like the one we've just done today. Uh, the previous two webinars in this series are in our webinar library and are available on demand. Uh, this one will be available within the next few days. And we have one more webinar scheduled for sometime, probably mid-September, which is on the next white paper on safety distance of devices. But more important than that, if you wanna get the standard itself, which is really what I would recommend, uh, it's available from a number of places for download. Uh, the price is only $359. And I say only, I know some of you might think that's a good chunk of change, but relative to the amount of money that you would need to spend to get equivalent information from the number of different ISO and, uh, and IEC standards, it's really just a drop in the bucket. So unless you're actually designing um, devices or interlocks or, or other types of risk reduction measures, you, this really is a one-stop shop within the B1119 standard to get all the pertinent information for an integrator or uh, a user that's installing or maintaining risk reduction measures. So with that, I realize we have a few minutes left and Lisa, I'm gonna ask you if there are any questions we can answer with the time we have remaining. Thank you, Chris. Yes, we'll go ahead and take some questions now. Um, it looks like we only have time for one or two questions, but any questions that we don't have um, answered, Chris will reach out um, and answer them for you. So the first question, Chris, I have is, are guards considered secondary to other engineering controls? such as control functions and devices? Absolutely not. Uh, one of the things that happened in the new B1119 structure, one of the modifications uh, to the standard itself was the structure and organization of the standard. In this new edition, the fourth edition, all the risk reduction measures addressed are reorganized according to the hierarchy of controls. And in that structure, physical barriers like guards are listed second only to inherently safe design measures. So what that means is if you're designing a machine and can't inherently design it so the hazard isn't present, the very next best approach is to address it with guards. Um, and what those do, and what it does is it's the first, it's the first choice that's often applied when you cannot fully redesign a machine. So especially for end users that have a machine and you're not gonna completely dismantle and reimagine it, physical guards really are the best approach. They're simple, they're proven, and they really are one of the most common solutions in industry. They do seem on the surface to have uh, relatively low complexity to other types of risk reduction measures, but there's still, as we just saw today, a lot of nuance that goes into the different functions and features that they can fulfill. So even though it only is addressed in about 15% of the standard is addressing specific to guards, considering there's five different big buckets of risk reduction measures and how simple they are and how proven they are, um, it, it really is, I think addressed adequately, not only adequately, but thoroughly within the standard. Everything you could need to know and want to apply when selecting the feature of a physical barrier is addressed in there. But just because there's a lot more content uh, on devices uh, where there's emerging technologies and new fields of study and science, it doesn't mean that a guard is any less important or any less useful with reducing risk to individuals. Awesome. And the next question is, and you spoke earlier about interlock guard and what needs to be considered when assessing a hazard zone. Um, are there any special considerations to be made when a person is inside a hazard zone and needs to come out? Yes. So if there's a person inside a hazard zone behind an interlocked guard, that's what we call whole body access. Um, that in and of itself is in a, a very deep discussion, uh, which is why we have already done a, a webinar on that. The previous webinar, part two of the series was specifically on that topic, uh, and it addresses all the different ways to address those concerns. If there's one of the concerns, one of the ways to address it is to ensure that a person can get out before the hazard begins. 
So that could be uh, having interlocks that are capable of internal release, whether the interlock device itself is a standard interlock or if it's a guard locking interlock. And depending on the size and the complexity of the application, that more than likely is going to be used in conjunction with another measure, which is known as a, an, an initiation warning system, which tells you either that the machine has been reset and is about to begin motion, or it's a warning that says the system is about to begin motion. In either case, it gives some period of time with some warning, either audible or visual or both, that tells the person inside the cell, you should get out of there. And then make sure that the door itself is capable of, of opening so people can exit the hazardous area as quickly as possible. But the, the, the webinar, um, the last webinar from a few months ago and the entire white paper in this series both address more of the nuance and more of the detail associated with all the concerns of whole body access. Awesome. I see some great questions come in, but unfortunately we're out of time. But like I said, Chris will reach out to you and we also are going to create a blog post with all these questions um, so you can see what other people are asking as well. So thanks, Chris. Thanks for your time and thanks for our audience for listening in. Um, please visit sick.com to know about our next upcoming webinar about the ANSI B1119. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chris.